Welcome to The Dojo, the podcast where we turn marketing news into marketing tasks. This week, we'll hear three stories, including one from our special guest, where we kind of got two special guests today, which is very fun. Then we will pick the one that's kind of most actionable and we'll help turn it into tasks that you can do today. So I'm Jess, I'm a digital marketing specialist for Exposure Ninja. And today I'm joined by Tim Cameron Kitchen, the founder of Exposure Ninja. Charlie Marchant, the CEO of Exposure Ninja, and our special guest, Nina Piotrowska, Marketing and Communications Officer at Bradford District and Craven Health and Care Partnership on the Healthy Minds Priority. Nina, welcome to the dojo today. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> well, thank you for visiting us, I guess I would call it. Um, <laughs> Nina, it would be really great to know, what's your relationship to marketing? I think I'm still a young person in marketing, so I'm 22. Um, I've been in the industry now like full time for about a year and a half, um, but I've been doing like work experience from when I was about 13. Um, but obviously I did marketing comms in mental health and healthcare, working kind of like a partnership way. So I work with the NHS, work with charity organizations, councils, um, grassroots, things like that. But I think obviously, just as a young person, I've kind of grown up on social media, grown up with that kind of ev evolution. Um, so yeah, I love being creative and I love being able to speak my mind and create things and create change. And I think social media and marketing is the perfect way to do that. Yeah, I totally agree. Nina, I have to say, when I was like looking on your LinkedIn and looking at interviews you'd done in the past, when you said you were 22, I was like, really? <laughs> You've achieved so much and you have such a presence online. So yeah, I was um, very impressed, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> I think when I, because I'm neurodivergent, I think when I'm passionate about something, I can just kind of tunnel vision and do it. And I'm really grateful for a lot of the opportunities. And I think LinkedIn is such a good platform to do that. Um, but I think it's just about getting stuck in and speaking up. So I'm very grateful that I've been able to do a lot of those things. Yeah, well, you've definitely put yourself out there and, and made those connections. And we're excited to hear your story that you'll be bringing later in the podcast. But first, we're going to jump in with some WordPress beef. Tim, please share this gossip that you have today. Yeah, yeah I'm going to be bringing some drama today. Um, this is sort of soap opera style. I honestly wouldn't bring this to the podcast unless it was about pretty much one company. If this is either about Google or WordPress, I would bring it. Otherwise, I wouldn't. Um, the reason I think this is important is because WordPress powers about 40% of the internet and 80% of all content management systems in use online any 80 percent of all websites using cms's are wordpress so this is important for lots of businesses to know what's happening inside wordpress or with wordpress so um okay bit of a background on this so wordpress has is run by a company called automatic and the founder of automatic is a guy called matt mullenweg now WordPress has two versions. It has WordPress.com, which is like a paid service that automatic sells. And it's got WordPress.org, which is the one that most of us are familiar with. This is the open source um, sort of free platform that we build websites in. Exposure Ninja just built hundreds of WordPress websites. Our WordPress, our website is WordPress. Lots of websites that we uh, work with are WordPress. So um, there's also a hosting company called WP Engine. WP Engine is unaffiliated with WordPress. It's a uh, hosting platform that's been around for many years. It's a huge company, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in revenue, one of the better known WordPress specific hosting platforms of which there are many. Now, this all started with a blog post that Matt from WordPress, so Matt, the founder of Automatic, which creates WordPress, um, posted in September and basically taking issue with the amount of money and time that WordPress engine, sorry, WP engine contributed to the open source WordPress community. And open source is really important to WordPress and there's a sort of a community spirit around it and you've got to contribute and you've got to share your tips. And basically he was saying WP engine makes, you know, billions and millions and millions of dollars off WordPress and only contributes about 40 hours a week to the community. So this is not cool. Um, really harsh blog post using some very strong language, calling WP Engine's product a cheap knockoff and even a cancer to WordPress. So pretty strong. WP Engine responded by sending a cease and desist, claiming that Matt had demanded a lot of money to license the trademark 
WP engine, obviously supposed to sound like WordPress engine. So Matt's argument is, well, they're using our trademark without license and WP engine say it's, it's fair use. Whatever, whatever. This isn't a trademark thing. Matt then banned WP engine from accessing resource on wordpress.org. This basically broke loads of websites that were hosted on WP Engine. And I don't know how many websites hosted on WP Engine. My guess would be that it's millions. Um, so a lot of these were broken, as were their themes and plugins. People were really annoyed because when you can't update a theme or a plugin, there's a security vulnerability there. So potentially, as well as these sites being you know, broken, there's also security issues which could give people access to personal data or whatever. So this is a really big thing. And the community was quite angry about this. So WordPress then lifted the ban, allowing WP Engine temporary access so they could you know, resume business as usual. WP Engine found a workaround so it doesn't need to access in the same way or whatever. So that's now resolved. Um, but the beef hasn't gone away. W, uh, WordPress has added a little checkbox to the login screen on wordpress.org requiring people to say that they are not affiliated in any way to WP Engine. Um, WP Engine then sued Automatic last week. 159 employees at Automatic who didn't agree with the direction that Matt was taking WordPress then left. Like This is a big sort of fracture in the reassuringly boring and stable fabric of WordPress, which has been around for a long, long time. And it's been very boring and very stable, which is what you want in a website platform. The last thing you want in a website platform is for it to be run by some unhinged person who can take things in a completely different direction and cause all sorts of chaos. So the reason that we care about this is that there's a bit of a personal vendetta thing, or that's how it feels. It feels very personal and petty in some ways. And there's a lot of concern from developers that WordPress is vulnerable to the petty vendettas of one person. And that therefore, the platform itself is not as stable and secure as many of us in the industry had thought. My take on this is that at the moment, this seems to be directed at WP Engine only. There seems to be beef with one company only. There seems to be some annoyance about the trademark issue which has flourished into this um, awful beef that it affects loads of website users. I think if this behavior from Matt becomes a pattern, if it looks like he's going after other businesses, then I think a lot of developers, probably including Exposure Ninja, might start building contingency plans for moving sites away from WordPress. Because the last thing you want is all of a sudden, Matt decides that your hosting provider sucks and is a cancer and that they're going to turn off you know, access for your website. Like that would be awful, right? Um, so I don't think there's anything that we need to do yet. We don't need to go and rebuild our websites on another platform yet, but we do need to keep an eye on this. <clears throat> Sorry, Vim's going to edit these out, right? Um, we do need to keep an eye on this because if this becomes a trend, there are some concerns about kind of long term, long term stability there. Any thoughts, peeps? Only that that's not an ideal situation. I don't think for marketers and website owners, but also. A continuation of that kind of behavior from a CEO or from any sort of C-suite level in a organization is potentially their own undoing as well. So I imagine the employees have their own concerns about what's going on right now, because that's not the kind of culture you want to work in, the, the kind of direction you want to see the business where you're employed going either. That's true. Yep, I think there would be a question about how much control he has over the company and whether they, they could be like an overthrowing or something like that, how much support. I mean, at the moment, all of this stuff seems to be coming from Matt rather than from Automatic as a company. So it would be interesting to see how much support he has for this kind of approach across the company. The 159 employees who left Automatic uh, mainly worked in the team that was my understanding is they mainly worked in the team that was responsible for sort of working on the ecosystem and working with partners. So there's clearly a sort of a fracture there for, for so many people to leave in a single day. Um, yeah. Does it does this make you concerned, Charlie, about recommending WordPress as a platform at this stage? Do you think? I think it's still an early stage. And I think a kickback like 159 employees leaving is probably enough for most sensible CEOs to change their behavior going forward. I think if I was at the stage of building a website for the first time, 
and I was looking for a platform, I'd be more concerned. Whereas the thought of the actual cost of attempting to rebuild your whole site, especially if you're running a large sort of e-commerce or anything like that through WordPress, I think this wouldn't be enough to actually instill and create enough fear to make a change there. Mm. I think this is kind of a bit reminiscent of like, you know, Twitter becoming X and having a really big shift. It screams CEO who sort of is, is maybe, I don't know, taking a bit too much Per, like personal control of it but it's also me and Tim were actually talking about this earlier about um when Instagram and Facebook went down for that like extended period of time and a lot of people were kind of left in the lurch because they didn't really have a contingency plan or a backup plan for where they would be if something went wrong and I suppose if we're all kind of renting our places online you really do have to have a couple of backup plans you know in place Nina I don't know if you've kind of had any situations on social media where one platform has sort of become unusable or maybe you've had to leave a platform because it doesn't align with the company's goals or anything like that um I think from my end obviously working on a mental health website that is basically kind of like a google for mental health support and services in Bradford and Craven um I think my concern would be like if things went down, you didn't have that kind of plan that it probably could affect a lot of people that are using that website. If you didn't have a backup and, you know, these people that need services and need to use on online things to find things like we're so online now, we use like search engines to find everything, like how to get somewhere on maps. But I guess from a mental health point of view, it could be quite damaging that a lot of people maybe wouldn't have that support or access on where to go when a lot of things are going online now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's another time where we realize how, I guess, fragile the internet that we become so reliant on actually is, where, you know, one provider somewhere along the chain can get hacked or can act unhinged, the CEO can go off on one, and all of a sudden, the whole thing sort of folds in on itself, doesn't it? And you can say, well, all right, we need a contingency plan. Well, what if, if you didn't like WordPress, what would you move to? Webflow. I think Webflow is a private company, right? So anything could happen there. They could not raise their next round of investment or if they're profitable, they could, you know, go un- unprofitable. Like it's really, it's it feels a lot more uh, fragile, I think, the system that we're so used to relying on when these things happen. But it's actually difficult to mitigate away all of the potential eventualities, it seems. I, I would say from my experience, we work with Few and Far, which is like a smaller company. So when things, for example, the riots were happening, um, we had to put up a page about, we had to respond really quickly about ethnically and culturally diverse things and things that were going on in Bradford that were affecting everyone. And if we didn't work with them and couldn't get them on the phone, like it would have been really difficult to maybe figure out how to make a whole new aspect of a website that we don't really have the experience with. So I think from my experience, sometimes it is beneficial to work with smaller companies that have invested interest in your CMS and in your website because it works a lot better with what you're trying to achieve. But that's just that's just my experience on that. Yeah, sometimes the big players can be more unstable in some instances than the smaller ones. I always see this joke online that's like um, a lot of the internet is internet's functionality is based on somebody thanklessly updating some code somewhere in Alaska and I always think about that because I think it is true I think a lot of the internet is built on things that people did you know in like the early 2000s that they just did because they wanted to and then something massive has been built out of it um but yeah it's yeah so it's a bit of a wobbly situation there Tim and hopefully things things get resolved soon Charlie, let's talk about your story about generative engine optimization. I've seen this word hopping around the exposure into Slack recently, and it'd be great to know whether it's something we need to be thinking about or if it's kind of a fad, I guess. Sure. I think the internet is throwing some jargon around about this, so I wanted to break it down on the podcast. So I guess the question I'm asking are, are marketers actually doing generative engine optimization, GEO, like SEO, but with a G? Or is everyone just getting confused about AI? So the internet's recently coined the term GEO to describe ways to optimize for generative engines. Or if I just take all the jargon out of that, getting your business recommended in answers 
from ChatGPT, Perplexity, Claude, all the rest of them, and getting into AI search features. So basically the AI overviews. Weirdly, it's not anything to do with geography or locations, which I think is the first thing that probably comes to mind. Um, so the name might be a bit confusing, but it actually came out of a research paper that's pre-publication. So uh, there's a website called archive.org, uh, not with the traditional spelling, put all of the Roman numerals in there and then you'll get the right spelling, uh, coining this term. So it's actually come from academic circles rather than specifically marketing ones, which is interesting in itself. So archive.org is, is basically a pre-publication forum in the science community. So um, there's no peer review, it's not a finalized journal or anything, but usually um, people in that community will put research papers there in their early stage to sort of get comments and feedback from the wider community before they then try and get that into a journal for publication. So we could say that this is a very sort of early piece of work that's coined that term. Um, but very recently, it seems to have created a bit of a flood of this term being used in the marketing community, in the SEO community especially, but quite potentially just because we don't have a name for this thing, like this type of optimization that we're doing. So I don't know whether the name will continue or not, but I think we will see it more and more. And we're definitely seeing search results, search volumes starting to increase for it early stage as well. A bit more in the US, I would say, than in the UK based on what I can see at the moment. The thing I don't know is how many marketers are actually even aware of it though, or trying to get their brand mentioned in AI chatbots. At the moment, that's still a small percentage of searches. So compared to Google, and search engine search, it's it's just a small flicker, but it is, I guess, a bit of a flicker on the horizon. I wouldn't be surprised if it takes over versus, I think, how many marketers are actually just trying to create a heap ton of content using chat GPT and uh, other other AI chatbots and just flood the Internet with that. Um, I saw a stat recently that was 56 percent is the amount content production has increased by since chat GPT launched, which is. It's pretty wild if that's true. But then also that same that same research was showing there's like an expectation from bosses for the average marketer to also be producing more content, which I don't think is unexpected. I think if you're a boss and you are seeing what the capabilities of ChatGPT and the rest of them can do, that probably is going to be one of the first things on your mind. I think it's definitely been on our mind as well at Exposure Ninja as a result. Um, so I guess... How much of a focus is there, though, on just creating like reams and reams and high volumes of content rather than thinking about how we actually optimizing? What does the future of search look like? How likely is AI to be a new way of searching? How likely is it there'll be more AI overviews, new AI search features that actually happen? And is the content we're producing going to rank for those as opposed to are we just creating a massive volume of content? The trouble is, I think there's no clear way to measure something like GEO. So you can look at visibility metrics, but you can't actually be tracking how many times your business is being mentioned by ChatGPT or Claude or Perplexity. You can manually test it, but you're probably going to get different types of results. You're definitely going to get different results from the next person who's typing into it. There's loads of nuances because it's trying to pick up all of the relevancy. So if you're typing into it, you know, what's the what's the best coffee machine? Recommend me a coffee machine to buy. It's probably going to give me something different to what it would give you, Jess. Tim, you'd never be drink, drinking coffee, so you wouldn't type that in. But just based on the kinds of coffee that you drink, what you usually buy, your preferences, if you have iced coffee, hot coffee, if you make espresso, if you make milky coffee, all these sorts of things, it's going to start giving different answers. So it's almost impossible, really, to be doing enough manual research for the average company to really measure that which then causes another issue for marketers. How are they meant to get that past their boss? So they want to be preparing their company for the future of search. They want to be preparing for AI, but they're going to try and get sign off for something that has no clear metric to measure it, isn't going to be directly attributable to ROI. They're probably not even going to get that into the boardroom. What do we think? Yeah, it's um, it still feels a little bit all over the place, I guess, in terms of what you're trying to do on search, what you're trying to do in the chatbots. And I always just say, just make good stuff that's actually useful. 
because that just feels like that's the most important thing that you can do. It should be what you've been doing with content throughout time anyway. But me and Tim were chatting earlier about how, you know, there was kind of an influx of these articles at one point. They were like top 10 performance management softwares or something, you know, and then they would list all these, all these CRMs or whatever. And we're noticing in the AI overviews now that it will list something like Salesforce, but it's not actually Salesforce that's linked next to that recommendation. It will be their competitor who's put together this article. Were those articles ever really that use useful? You know, if I'm being told I need to compare 15 different softwares, I'm immediately overwhelmed. I don't want to be here. I feel like there's too many choices. I'm stressed. Is that actually useful? Maybe there are people who want to look at all 15, but I think maybe they need to re rethink that because I think they're probably overwhelming their brains. Um, so I've, I am intrigued to see how content adjusts over time and if it if it does start to become genuinely more helpful with the helpful content update kind of spurring that on a bit or whether it does continue to just kind of be very SEO-y kind of how many keywords can we fit in type thing but we'll see. Nina how are you kind of finding that AI is impacting your job role on a day-to-day -day? are you kind of doing anything to rank in any of these AI searches or anything like that? Yeah, I think the AI, AI searches, I think that's probably something really new that I probably haven't heard of until you've mentioned it. Um, I do think it's interesting to see the progression of AI. And I think I was having this conversation with my friend who's in marketing. I don't think it's maybe, I think there's like like that, it's kind of like Marmite. Some people are like, oh, you shouldn't be using that. And other people, I think I quite enjoy it because it makes things easier. I kind of see it as like, a fridge or a car like even though we can live without it it might be able to help us in ways i was also going to add there with searches with social media um i read something the other day about younger people are actually instead of saying what coffee shop should i go to or shall i buy this product they're going on tiktok or instagram to see user generated content from influencers they trust and community so i think sometimes chat gpt and ai with that kind of it could be inauthentic and maybe that's like a different demographic, but I think there's a massive shift. And actually, in a few years, are we going to be going on Google to search things up? I know, like when I when I want to go somewhere, I won't go on Google. I'll go and write, read a blog. Like I'll go and see what people have done on TikTok and online. So I think that's a really interesting shift as well. And whether AI will take on to that, I don't know. But yeah, I completely agree with that. And I think it speaks to the same thing which is it would be really short-sighted to just assume that google search is going to be the dominant search engine of the future as well because that's not what we're seeing from younger generations like you say nina we're seeing searches across lots of different platforms we're seeing the google search results showing youtube a lot more showing reddit a lot more than it was doing we're seeing buyer journeys going across lots of those different platforms and actually when we're thinking about SEO or GEO or both, because actually they're very interrelated and overlapping, it's worth business owners and marketers thinking cross-platform and not only thinking about what is the future of search going to be on Google, but what is the future of search going to be across all of these different types of search engines. Yeah, just from kind of a personal perspective, me and my partner are planning a holiday at the moment and we've he asked ChatGPT, like, could you make some suggestions, maybe suggest like a potential budget, some things we can do, etc. That's kind of the bare bones plan. And then we've been going to YouTube to type in like, what's the weirdest roadside attractions in California? Like, so we can physically see them and be like, oh, okay, because that's how we prefer to get our information. But it's, I wonder if we are going to start to see, I mean, I feel like people do this anyway, but it's not just going to be one touch point. Maybe we'll have a look in the AI and then there'll be some recommendations in there. And then we'll be like, OK, that's not quite for us. We want to go find something a bit more specific elsewhere and then kind of combine the two together. Like there's nothing wrong with that as well. I think it's a very normal way to to kind of make a decision is to collate things from different different locations. I suppose it's just whether AI might start doing that for us a little bit, bring in stuff from YouTube bring in some recommendations maybe they see that we always want to look at weird stuff when we're on holiday so maybe automatically they're like do you want to look at weird stuff this holiday or not <laughs> and it will give us that choice you know but I feel like the AI isn't quite there yet in terms of kind of what you described earlier Charlie of like will it know I normally drink this type of coffee because I've made those searches in the past I feel like it's not 
whenever I get an, a response from it, it's supposed to be more tailored, but it feels really hollow. So I am wondering in the future if we do start to get a bit more of like, you know, it knows that in the past we've looked for weird places to visit in California. So whenever we make searches about California, it's going to give us things that are somewhat relevant. Tim. I think, I, I think <laughs> that's where the device manufacturers and the, the, the operating system, phone operating system companies will come in. That's what Apple wants to do with Apple intelligence. It's what Google wants to do with the on-device Gemini. And I think that ability to look cross-platform to find answers for you and tailor those answers to your preferences, your history. I think that's where a new version of Siri, if Apple can execute it properly, will be really interesting. And then like you say, Charlie, as marketers, how do we deal with that? Because there's no, when you're asking Apple intelligence a question and it's giving you a search result, the only reason we can track our rankings on Google, we can track our rankings on TikTok is this because those searches are cached. So they're fairly consistent. The results that you get are fairly consistent. So SEMrush can say, oh, you're ranking position two for this search. And you might be up and down, but broadly you're going to be position two. Whereas these generative AI models, they're sort of surfacing a new answer each time. And if that answer is happening on device and you can't actually see that from outside, how do marketers even know? that these brand searches or these brand searches on TikTok or Google or these website visits have been have originated from somebody asking Siri what the best hotel to go in Croatia is like there's a layer of untrackability here that is going to feel alien to most first generation performance marketers I think and I can't see Apple or yeah, I can see Google selling the data, but I can't see Apple selling that data to marketers, which means that we're going to be flying a little bit blind. And I think the only thing that we'll be able to do is just focus on getting as much information out there into the world about our business on as many platforms as we possibly can, both with the hope that these platforms surface our business or our products, but also with the hope that the next generation of language models, when they're trained on the internet's data, they see loads of mentions of our business. They build up an understanding of what our business does and what it stands for and who it sells to. And that means that when that person asks asks a question to ChatGPT or whatever, like Reddit surfaces generative AI answers at the top of some of its search results now, that those generative AI answers include mentions of our business. But this is a potentially very untrackable world and i think it's a lot less linear to optimize for something like this because there is no single visibility algorithm that we can manipulate and reverse engineer like there has been with google so this is interesting i think this is the biggest shift that we marketers have possibly seen for quite some time i don't i don't know how it's going to play out but someone's going to figure it out i'm sure hopefully it'll be us <laughs> Yeah, I think just staying in tune with it and trying to keep up with changes, even if you're not putting them in action right this second, can be can be really helpful. Now, Nina, let's move on to your story, which is about the power of social media in mental health awareness. Please tell us more. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think it will link to maybe like the opposite of what maybe AI can't bring, I guess. And it's this general community shift in the social media space. So I wanted to start with maybe like a bit of media evolution. Obviously we had traditional media before with like newspapers, TV, we were very like passive media consumers um, and everything was kind of top down. You know, we'd have maybe a few people owning all the newspapers and that's kind of what we consume. And now with social media and how it's evolved, we've seen like a massive shift in this. So, um, we're able to kind of actively create, share and comment on content. There's a two way dialogue, even from maybe, I don't know if it's everyone's era, but like even maybe like 10 years ago, five years ago with like YouTube, the biggest people would have like a million subscribers and they'd kind of still be that big content creators. Whereas now there's, I liked what you said earlier about flooding the internet. There's so much out there and actually there's not going to be these big content creators anymore, these big people that there's lots of small pockets of communities across social media. Um, and I think again, bringing mental health into this, it's enabling users to shape narratives themselves and 
sensitive topics like mental health. So like with user generated content, um, we can, yeah, everyone has their own ability that like we all have a phone to kind of make content. Anyone can do social media and, you know, just pick up a video, pick up their phone and make a video about something they're experiencing. Um, and I think in some ways it's been a key driver of change for how mental health is perceived, which just shows the power that social media has to kind of uh, change narratives and create change. Um, for example, you know, we were talking about Reddit earlier, but we've got Instagram broadcast, TikTok, like we're seeing a massive shift in just social media to community spaces. And I, I think Instagram broadcasts are, and even WhatsApp broadcasts are a really good way because it's about being interactive. Even these big influencers now are wanting to have their audiences are wanting to have smaller groups where they can kind of interact and provide peer support. Um, so I think positively with mental health, you're kind of seeing that and people speaking about things. But I do think it's important to note that, you know, because there's so much information online, it can really fuel anxiety and fears. There's a massive thing now with the mental health community people with kind of OCD or anxiety where you might search something up on Reddit, you know, do I, and it kind of can fuel a lot of anxieties and misinformation. And, you know, if you have a bunch of anxious people in an echo chamber on a certain um, thing, space of TikTok, a certain algorithm, then that can lead to people's mental health being a lot worse. Um, I wanted to bring in people like Mind and Young Minds. Um, they're quite big kind of charities, mental health charities that I feel like I've really harnessed this shift. Like you look at mine's uh, TikTok and it's all about memes. It isn't really, you know, it's kind of user generated content, but they'll use people like young people and influencers to lead conversations instead of it being top down. They'll kind of uh, approach people that already exist within the community to help empower community and kind of, uh, what's the word, look for audiences that already exist and to what they want. Um, I also think, you know, um, it when the pandemic, I don't know if you guys saw this, but there was a massive increase of like ADHD and autism and people self-diagnosing and lots of content being like, oh, I might experience this. And I don't think that would have happened without the community space of social media. Uh, it is OCD Awareness Week this week. And I even me, I've learned a lot of OCD that I wouldn't have learned if it wasn't for social media and these individuals coming together and actually sharing resources that aren't already out there in mental health support. Um, and I think that's really important for awareness and kind of peer support and sharing personal narratives and things like that. But that's like an overview, but I guess it is interesting without mental health with it, that shift to community kind of personal sharing and how that media kind of has changed. And I think it's shifting more and more. And again, the internet is so unpredictable, but I think, you can't be inauthentic anymore and you can't um you need to find ways to really interact and i think with your communities and people don't like people talking down to them they want to interact and things like that so yeah i, I feel like you guys ask questions and i can't think of a, a question but is that <laughs> no, it's okay. yeah. it's okay. i already have thoughts so okay <laughs> yeah, yeah we've um, all got questions we're just being polite and waiting our turn <laughs> yeah yeah it's all good I think the main thing that stood out for me is you talking about like when you said that it used to kind of be like a one-way conversation and now it's a two-way conversation so when I was in school I had a friend who had OCD and up, that was like secondary school and up until that point it was known as like the tidying up disorder and you like things to be neat and then I met her and she was like oh I have OCD and you know we were like 12 you know we're small um and then she's explaining to me kind of the stuff that she would go through. And I was like, that's not what I've been told. That's not what I watched on that, like, obsessive compulsive cleaners show. Whereas now you can then create your own content online to kind of be like, this is the one thing you've heard. Here's an alternative, an alternative view from somebody else's perspective, which in this instance can be really really helpful because at that time maybe a small group of people who it seems were being exploited to push one narrative about what people thought OCD was um you know in the current day other people with OCD would be able to kind of say their piece and explain how they experience it because these things are rarely one size fits all and the other thing I wanted to mention as well is I'm a person who started my ADHD diagnosis like on TikTok which 
always sounds a little bit I always feel embarrassed about that but it's not embarrassing that I just found out that all these traits that I'd been like punishing myself for for like 25 years were actually somewhat out of my control and just kind of built into me but I wouldn't have known that without TikTok that just so happened to the algorithm on TikTok can be a problem but in this instance it was showing me content that was relevant to me and was seeing well based on this person's behaviors let's feed them this one video about ADHD oh she watched that for an extended period of time maybe we should give her more and then it was like that makes a lot of sense and then you know I went for my diagnosis and they were like that was very easy to diagnose you with that because it was very obvious but it was like I wouldn't have known that I would still now be struggling with things that I just didn't understand and thought were shortcomings that I was creating for myself and I'm not saying I always say ADHD is not your fault but it is your responsibility but even then if you don't understand what the problem is you can't be responsible for it you can't start putting things into place so yeah I think that was um that was really really insightful I think a lot of people will will relate to that (laughs) yeah I really think the rise of people talking more about ADHD autism all of those types of things and sharing their experiences has probably led to light bulb moments for quite a few people who are like oh that is maybe a little bit like me or that's actually you know those spectrums are so large and expansive that there will be plenty of people who sit within those spectrums that don't even share the same kinds of qualities but perhaps come under that sort of same labeling umbrella that gets used um I think the the really interesting thing this speaks to is back to that same point before Jess about the importance that people place on seeing personal experiences from people and what you were saying too Nina about young people more and more looking onto social platforms searching directly onto YouTube searching directly onto TikTok and actually looking for experiences of individuals as opposed to necessarily information that's being brought by even companies and organizations sometimes as well if they're not actually managing to get those insights of individuals into the content that they create. And actually, I think how important it is to have a world where we can connect to individual experiences in the way we search, as well as understanding broader trends and seeing larger pieces of, you know, content that contains generalizations as well. I think both are really important. I think that's there's like positive and cons in that as well because we obviously do want community and sometimes can't you just can't connect for people in person so especially people that maybe like live in the countryside or aren't in a big city and don't have access to those communities I think it can be great and we don't always want to hear like a big CEO ban being like this is what you should do like we want people that are just genuine and that we can relate to and I think that authenticity does thrive online but I also think you know there's so much going on in the world with politics and those kind of echo chambers that you can get stuck in can really like sometimes um, give people really harmful ideologies and we get stuck in just speaking to one set of people instead of like the whole spectrum of lots of ideas so I think there's positives and negatives to it. Yeah part of the dangers of those uh, algorithms giving you more and more of the same. Go on Tim. I was going to say exactly on that. I think, Nina, you mentioned the importance of organisations here. And I think the trouble with social media is that there's a really skewed narrative when it comes to health, because you know, my wife went through an ADHD um, diagnosis a year ago, and it's completely changed her world. But what I've noticed is that she just, although she just sends me these memes of like, this is exactly how I feel this. And it's typically ADHD influencers who are obviously the game is engagement, right? The game is not necessary. They're they're not coming from a place often of like, I'm trained to help people in this situation. They're coming to, they're a general content creator. They got an ADHD diagnosis. They've gone super deep in ADHD and they're getting all this engagement, all this comments from people. And there's so many stories and studies. I'm on one in, in the National Library of Medicine at the moment about the link between TikTok content and how, how it ends up. You end up in these really deep eating disorder sort of rabbit holes where you look at something and then you get it serves you the next more in depth, and you get more and more and more in depth, and you get deeper into this tunnel. And there's an incentive for the content creators to essentially accelerate that by being the next more extreme version, because then you get more engagement. 
a study from uh, who's this? This is Oxford University and NHS Mental Health Services in the last week that was covered in um, FT. The percentage of uh, ten to six six to ten year olds in contact with NHS funded mental health services has doubled in the last five years. Doubled in the last five years from eleven to fifteen, the girls have gone from nine point two percent to sixteen point eight percent. That's eleven to fifteen year old girls, and this study links directly social media use to anxiety and depression. And it feels to me like the organisations like Mind have such an important job here where they can be where people are with a positive message because their incentive is not just maximize engagement, their incentive is to help. They have a different mandate. And this just feels like that it's a war and the good team, the organizations that have the incentives to help need all of our support, all of our help. And we need to do everything we can to help them win because there are plenty of creators who unwittingly, I think, are making this potentially worse. Um, so yeah, I know it's a contentious thing. I just wanted to throw it out there yeah. and see what you thought really, Nina. I think it's really true. I think, again, like it can be really helpful. You might like I can find Muslim autistic people online. Whereas sometimes when you go to groups in person, like you might just get a certain type of person or, you know, things like that. But I do really agree with you. Like my therapist, when my, a lot of my mental health issues come from overthinking and a lot of, sometimes we always have to get to the bottom of things when really we can just let things be sometimes with mental health. We don't need to figure it out. And I think on, online, um, we kind of, it's all about information overload and actually I do think it makes things worse long term like I know even though as a marketer when I go off social media I feel loads better because it isn't the real world and it can make a lot of your mental health problems worse and actually we don't always need the answers to things and I think in general as a society I do think this information overload and constantly being online constantly being flooded with so many opinions can be really overwhelming and isolating and it can definitely I definitely agree with you can make mental health a lot worse and give us too much information that we don't need I don't think our brains are made for that so I think it's about getting off social media and like using it in a you know in in bits and drabs um but I think being chronically online and chronically trying to figure out ADHD and like like you said it can become personality and there's no judgment there because I've been there but it, there's more to people than one thing if that makes sense and I, I do think there's something to be said with these organizations and even with the government to how we kind of change the society to make sure we're looking after our well-being and putting that first while still being able to connect with people as humans but yeah it's like social media has helped us identify the problem and the gaps. And lots of us can now identify that we have things that we want to work on. Now we need to identify a solution to this, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully organizations like yours can be a, a big part of that. And it's reassuring to know that they've got monsters like you digging into this. And uh, yeah, you're, you're doing amazing work. Yeah, you're meeting people where they are in, in the place that these things are happening, which is which is amazing. Yeah. So now's part of the podcast where we pick the best story. Well, I say the best story. This isn't a competition. It's just the one that we feel like our audience will be able to take away an action um, today and that we think is the most important. And then Charlie and Tim are going to break down some actions for us. So is, are, is there any stories that people particularly think are the most important to take away from today? I, I wish think with this one. the geo and kind, but I kind of I think we've actually even though they've all been really different have linked into each other really well and it's kind of that authenticity of being online, AI and how we kind of manage that and like community online and whether we trust big kind of organisations or whether it's time to kind of maybe make things on a smaller scale if that makes sense. So I think I can't pick one, but I do think geo is maybe the main one, but. Yeah, I think you're probably right that I love when all the stories connect together in some little secret way. It's always it's always good. It always makes me really happy. So if we think about the the generative engine optimization, Charlie, what tasks do you think that marketing managers can take away from this story that they can go and do once they finish listening to this podcast? I think the best thing for marketing managers is to be thinking about the future and probably approaching the conversations they have with their boss 
or if that's the CEO, that might be a CMO, to actually have those conversations about where is the business getting its customers in the future? What does that look like? Where are all our customers coming from now? And if a big portion of that is search, then I think there's a really strong case for looking more and more at GEO. In terms of the really actionable tasks that they would take away, I'd firstly say like, don't panic and get confused and knots, but instead, Focus on what you know does well, similar to what you said earlier, Jess. Create content that is actually really useful and targeted to the customer personas that you're trying to sell to, which also means being very clear on who you're trying to sell to. And I think not just sticking with what you've always done, looking more towards how you show the authority that you have, how you ensure the content you put out is factually correct, which means definitely checking anything AI creates for you and looking at different content mediums as well. So doing things like perhaps creating audio that goes with your written content, perhaps looking at also making short, helpful videos that can rank in their own right, looking at how you get brand mentions, do PR, work with influencers that can help create the story of your brand in different places on the internet. So I think all the things that you're used to doing, but thinking about okay, how is search going to look in the future when you're doing them? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, but it's all super, super helpful. And I think the thing with AI, especially AI search, is it's going to change and evolve and being in there and doing the work now is a really great way to get on top of things, for sure. We're also going to publish a blog post that breaks this down in a very jargon-free way. So perhaps the the number one takeaway is to read that and it will be quite helpful. Amazing. Very cannot wait to read that, Charlie. I'm really excited for that one. Tim, what tasks can business owners take from this story? I think what Charlie said um at the end though is like building flexibility into your marketing plans. I know there's a temptation for large companies to do your marketing planning as a kind of a yearly thing where you're assigning budgets and all that. And some organizations are never going to be able to get away from that. But if you can. I would build flexibility in because things are changing really rapidly and you don't know what, none of us really know what search or what behaviors are going to look like in a year. We can take a decent guess, but things are changing more than ever. So if you've got that flexibility, that would be great. And I also think there's a part here about not demanding certainty from your marketing teams about where they're going to focus either because we're going to have to be experimenting. Everyone is experimenting. We are as much on the cutting edge of AI search as anyone. And we don't know where it's going to go. So it's almost like we're all in this together. We're all, you know, at the start of a theme park ride where you're sat with all of your your co-riders and you don't really know what to expect, but you know that you're all in it together. Um, I think that's where we're at with a lot of digital marketing at the moment. It's not like it was three, four, five years ago, where it's relatively stable and pretty linear. Um, Things are up and down and all over the place. So we've got to look alive and be sharp. There is a lot of change. And um, if you are struggling with all this change in SEO and AI and all this stuff, um, the team at Exposure Ninja are fantastic and we are very clued up on all this stuff. if you would like to work with us, if you would like to get some insight on how your SEO is performing specifically in the AI search as well, then head to explosionninja.com forward slash review. We'll give you a 15 to 20 minute review of all your marketing, including any AI search related stuff, if that's what you would like to see. And we'll send that over to you. Not everybody is eligible. You do have to apply, but you can do that at explosionninja.com forward slash review. Fab, I think now it's time, Nina, to interrogate you a little bit and ask you some questions about your experiences with marketing. Starting with, if you had just one hour to improve your marketing, what would you work on? I feel like this was a difficult question because an hour is not a lot of time. (laughs) But I think I was just saying, I feel like when you're getting into the industry and like you're just working every day, like you're not especially in my job it's quite fast paced so it's kind of like the next project the next project the next project and I don't always feel like I get to forward plan or like go back to the basis of like core messaging like I did it like maybe a year ago but like you know when you have a strategy and it helps you to really like base your content so I think I would just stop and maybe plan and like just take a step back and go back to the basics of like what why what the core messages are what's coming up in the next year make something look visually nice that I can just refer to 
I like that a lot. That's a fantastic use of an hour. On the other end of this scale, what would you do with an infinite marketing budget? I, my first, I have a few things, but the, my brain first went to film production because I feel like film production, especially because I love cinema, but I feel like we do a lot of things now like on our phones and I would love to just make like a massive documentary about mental health or like in this job specifically, like a, like just a massive film, do some like really good high production content because I feel like a lot of t- times now you have to work with what you've got especially my job which is fine and it's fun you can make things on your phone but I feel like I've never had the chance to do something big so I've already yeah do something about all the services in Bradford all the people I think hearing people's stories is really important um another thing is I'd invest in community projects I think community initiatives especially in mental health have so much going for them and so much knowledge and so much resources but they don't well they have the resources if they had the money so if I had infinite budget I'd probably work together with them promote them in terms of mental health and things like that and then the last thing I said (laughs) because it is unlimited was maybe do a national campaign where I just give everyone in the UK or the world a mental health bank holiday and it maybe be like a hashtag mental health bank holiday but I'd promote it as a day to kind of re- reconnect with nature literally everyone do nothing like I guess I can't, we did in the pandemic but think about their mental health think about spending time with family and just reconnecting so obviously that's a big budget but I think the last one would be the funnest thing if you could just be like everyone just take a week off a day off for your mental health I love that. Think how much TikTok we could scroll in an entire day. (laughs) No, the rule would be no social media. It'd just be you'd have to go out. (laughs) You have to go to the outdoors. I love that. Um, Which marketing skill would you recommend 18 year old Nina works on and why? Yeah, so again, it wasn't that long ago, but um, I think (laughs) massive. (laughs) 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 A massive misconception that I didn't know is I think a degree alone isn't enough. So I'd firstly just say get stuck in and immerse yourself. I think I was then in third, I was in my third year of university, I hadn't really done any volunteering. I'd done some here and there. And I had someone on my course who had literally like founded a society. They were doing so much. They were doing the same course as me. And I was like, I need to step up and do something. So that's when I kind of started working with society, did marketing and like um, equality and diversity. So I'd just say experience is really key and you can only learn by doing, you know, if you go in and you say I have this degree, but if into a job interview, like so many people have that and I wish young people knew this, but you just need to go and do it. You need to experience. Um, and yeah, just get stuck in, just try, even if you don't need to know what you need, want to do, just do something. Um, and then another thing would be believing in yourself. I think youth voices are becoming more important. And I think sometimes because I'm young, I'm like, oh, hey, guys, uh, this is what I think. But actually, especially in my industry, I think a lot of people look to me. I think they can people can doubt you. But then when you show them your skills, they can be really impressed. And actually, I probably know quite a lot more than other people about social media and things like that. So I just say that belief in yourself that you do have knowledge and just go for it. Well, yeah, so. definitely. I love that last bit. That's yeah, really, really important. And finally, Nina, what are you most excited about in marketing right now? Okay, I think we're we're coming back to what we're talking about. But I think it is AI. I think there's so much, but I think again, it is like Marmite. Like I was saying, people aren't really sure how to take it, but like I really um, enjoy it, and it can really help me to like fine tune ideas. And if I don't really know how to start, maybe like a caption or something, I might say, oh, can you give me some ideas for this post? What do you think? Um, But again, I don't think it's something I would outright at work be like, yeah, I use this because I think again, a lot of maybe the older demographic are like, "Mm, no. So, but I think it's exciting to maybe see how it will develop and how it will help. And I think then I think there's going to be ups and downs. And sometimes it's just fun to experience what goes on in society and be like, oh, my God. I remember when it first came out, we were talking about the calculator. Cause when the calculator came out, people were like, no, guys, this is going too far. Like, we cannot use the calculator. Like, we're going to lose all of our human brain. So, um, and I guess quickly linking it back to mental health, there are some... I know like talking therapies, there's some uh, mental health services now that are using chatbots for like mental health support. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not going to really say my personal opinion on that, but I think it's interesting to maybe see 
how that might play out with AI and mental health and marketing and things like that. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Nina and Charlie. It's nice to have a couple of fresh faces on the podcast and I hope you've had fun chatting with us about marketing. Um, as always, we have over 300 episodes of our regular podcast and about 30, nearly 40 episodes of the dojo so if you enjoyed this there is more where that came from you can head over to our website explosionninja.com forward slash podcast or you can search up explosion ninja on any of your favorite podcast platforms thank you for joining us and we will see you next week bye